1975, I think arguably I had the best job in Austin, Texas. I had an advertising agency and I was the ad man for Armadillo World Headquarters. I had a studio in the back with some crazy artists, Michael Priest being one of them. He did this for Bruce Springsteen. This is November 6th, 1974, and uh, we did Bruce on that Thursday night for a dollar a ticket. But I thought, how long can, uh, uh, can I make money off of a guy like Willie Nelson? Uh, I was 26 years old, and man, he seemed old back then. <laughs> so I started reading. I was reading all kinds of stuff. So I started reading Bucky Fuller. And Bucky was famous with me for his book, Utopia or Oblivion which ties into what Paul just said, and also his, his major book, which was The Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. And what Bucky would say was that we had to move from a civilization that used capital energy to a civilization that used income energy. And of course, the capital energy stocks were our oil and our gas and our coal, and our income energy was our renewable resources the wind, the sun, etc. So I got this wonderful solar book by a fellow named Anderson. And, and I read it and read it and read it and read it and really got into passive solar. And at the beginning of the solar age, we had this active solar bunch, and we had this passive solar bunch. And the active solar bunch, they were the engineers. And basically, we were taking, you know, black surfaces and putting some glass over them and running photons, you know, smashing photons into this black surface. It'd get hot, and uh, we'd run water up to it and pump it, and we'd put freeze controls on it so, and it, so they would freeze. And we had, then we had passive solar. And passive solar was the architectural bunch. And they said, oh no, we, we build homes to where they themselves are collectors. We put the eaves in right. We put the insulation in. We place the windows correctly. We do all these things and we build a home that is sensitive to its environment. Then in the early 80s, suddenly solar was in big trouble. The energy policies, that came from Jimmy Carter were replaced by the policies of Ronald Reagan as he removed those solar panels off his house. And we decided at that time that we were going to have to, uh, I had to tell this story, I used, to, I used to think that, you know, when we had the passive solar, uh, the passive, I always ma imagined this cartoon with a, uh, a bunch of guys laying around and with their feet up on the chairs and they were uh, reading and drawing and they had hair and the cobwebs up in the corners and, and on the window on the door it said, you know, the, the Passive Solar Energy Society. <laughs> and so a few years after that, uh, some of us got together and we started the Passive Aggressive Solar Society and uh, actually we didn't. That was, uh, that was TRIA. So, at the same time during the 80s, then Albert Einstein's good idea was beginning to really take shape. And as most of you probably know, Albert Einstein did not get the Nobel Prize for E equals MC squared. He got the prize for the photovoltaic effect, that a photon of light would hit a crystal latticework and emit an electron. Now solar was becoming high tech. And so I became a SolarX dealer. And we did all the normal niche markets, you know, along the sides of the railroads. And we did the, the you know, the fence chargers. And we did all the things that were the niche markets that we were all looking at at that time, you know, pedestrian walkways, etc. I even did a pontoon boat 
for uh, Lake Travis. And the photovoltaic business began to grow. And then the wind came. Wind was the industry. It was the resource that put renewables on the table. It was the resource that made renewables relevant. Most of us knew that wind would be the first one to come online, and it did. When you hear someone say, there's enough wind at the Texas Capitol to blow all those windmills out in West Texas, be wary of that because that is the marginalization, the wolf of marginalization in the sheep's clothing of humor. There's 13 gigawatts of wind. So after working in the wind industry, after being in the photovoltaics business, then I became a utility queer. And I went to Austin Energy, and it was there at Austin Energy that we did some pretty good work. And we led when we could. We did conservation before conservation was cool. We did solar rebates 10 years ago. We had a green building program that's been copied all over the country. We had a green pricing program that's the most successful green pricing program. So we've tried to lead when we could. And it's from that position, that position as a utility guy, a renewable energy utility guy, that I can tell you today that solar has come of age. I know the difference between heat rates and heat rash. And let me tell you, there have been some big changes in solar in just the last few years. Number one, prices have collapsed. When I, five or six years ago, Roger Duncan asked me to try to figure out figure out what we needed to do in Texas to accelerate the use of solar and to decrease the price. Excuse me, I'm getting dry. And so I hired a consultant and we started talking, we started talking with all these pretty big shots in the industry and we were talking to one, I won't tell you his name, but we were talking to this one fella and he said, well I'll tell you the one thing you can do is that you can do something about those guys in Pasadena. And Pete looked at me and I looked at her and she went, yeah. I went, thanks. <laughs> I didn't know what he was talking about. But at that particular time, most of the silicon for our photovoltaic manufacturers was coming from Pasadena, Texas, and the price for a kilogram of silicon, silicon was $280. And you can see today, it's not 10 cents on the dollar, it's six or seven cents on the dollar. As of November, it was $16.50. And now, the price for a module is in the area of 66 cents. That was the holy grail just five years ago. Oh gosh, if we could just get to a dollar or what? We're headed towards 50 cents a watt. And that means at utility scale level right now, that means the Weberville plant that we put in just three years ago, which was the best price for solar in the country at the time, that the next time we do a big solar plant, it will be half that price. Solar energy at prices south of eight cents a kilowatt hour flat for 25 to 30 years is a bargain. And utilities should be investing in these plants now by the hundreds and hundreds of megawatts 
and we will because solar is the new wind. And right behind that will be local and distributed and community solar. Strategies like community solar that allow folks who don't have room on their roof or trees or whatever where they can join together will bring prices down. As we build a bigger industry and balance of system costs go down, and by the way, there's a session tomorrow on the Sunshot, which is dedicated, it's a federal program dedicated to reducing the balance of energy systems on our distributed systems so that they can reach what we've all dreamed of, and that is grid parity. And grid parity will be somewhere in the area of 10 or 11 cents. And according to the local Solar Advisory Committee report that we just received in Austin, grid parity, as I often say, is going to be next Tuesday. Sometimes things just kind of stay the same. But sometimes things really change, and they change quickly. Sometimes when you have a scale like this, and you put one more pebble over here, just one more pebble, it goes, and it moves completely and fully. Sometimes the ledge breaks off. When we moved from horses to horsepower a hundred years ago, we did it in 10 years. Look at the pictures of our cities in 1895 versus the pictures of our cities in 1915. Henry Ford sold 500 cars in 1905. He sold 500,000 in 1915. Last year alone, there were a half a billion smartphones sold. Ten years ago, I didn't even know anyone that had a smartphone. In one weekend alone, Apple sold a million of their fives. Sometimes things happen quickly, and that's what's happening at the solar industry. When I wrote Silver in the Mine in 2002, ten years ago, Total global manufacturing capacity in, in, in PV was 400 megawatts. And if you look at this chart here, you can see that last year we were at about 26 gigawatts. In 2012, they were doing about 9 gigawatts a quarter, so it may be in the area of 36 gigawatts. Now, on peak, that's... 36 nuclear power plants in terms of energy, take a quarter of that, that's, that's nine large nuclear power plants a year. And there's about 50 gigawatts of manufacturing capability in the world right now. You put all this together, like we've done in Texas, where you build the infrastructure to move the resources to the load, and you have the largest machine on earth. And this machine is the unified energy system. And in this unified energy system, buyers become sellers, sellers become buyers, and renewables begin to participate in the transportation market through the plug-in hybrids and electric cars. And in that grid will be capacitance and storage, old storage like, like we're beginning to have, new solid state storage, plug-in hybrid cars that will be flowing energy back to us, and other forms of energy, but I particularly like the solid state storage. To power the United States, we need a square 100 miles. To power the world, we need an area about the size of Texas, and if we broke it up, it would look like that. We've got plenty of land, but if you're Japan, you may have to build in the sea. Tomorrow will change us. It will shape us. When we went out into space and looked back at Earth, 
There are no R's, there are no D's, there are no fiscal cliffs, there are no countries. It is one earth. And this earth, when you look at it in a Bucky Fuller Dimexian world way, is not a bunch of continents with a bunch of oceans. It's one continent that's connected and it's surrounded by one great ocean. It's how you view things. According to the philosopher Bill Cosby, whether the glass is half full or half empty depends on whether you're doing the drinking or doing the pouring. <laughs> the solar age is now. When I was a young boy, I had a rock and roll band. And we set up the band and we went out and we were 16. We couldn't go drink. So we went out and bought two 10 cent gliders. And I took this glider and put it together, and I threw it into the air. And I said, look at this, it'll never come down. I just was bullshitting. It'll never come down. And it went up and it went around like this. And I remember seeing it touch a little bitty flower. And it went up and stalled, and then it went down and went up higher, and it went down and it went up higher, and it went down and it went up higher, and it went down and it accelerated and went up higher, and we watched it, and we got in our cars, and we followed it to the very north side of town into that north Texas panhandle wind, and it disappeared. Sometimes remarkable things happen. Humans are capable of great things. We are on the verge of watching our world go from horsepower to a new age and the return of the sun. And what a marvelous thing it will be and how blessed we are to see it happen. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.